This is the Winfield Bible School 2019. This is the uh, evening program by our brother Richard Morgan entitled The Ancient Egyptian Religion and Culture. Brother Richard, please. I just got to fit my doohickey in this contraption here. Alrighty. So, ancient Egypt for me has been a real fascinating study for the last several months as I've been preparing these classes. And I thought it would be interesting to fill in some of the gaps of what we've been talking about uh, this week. And what we have done and what we will be talking about to provide a little bit of historical and cultural context to what the children of Israel were experiencing and what both the Egyptians and the Israelites had to, as it were, unlearn as they learn who the one true God is. So what we're going to do in this class is uh, split it up into three sections. So we're going to start off by looking at one of the creation myths of the ancient Egyptians. And we talked about this a little bit in our class this morning of how what God was doing was, as it were, reversing the Egyptian creation. So let's have a look this evening at what one of those creation myths was. And then we'll look at this concept of order and chaos, which we touched on again this morning. And then what I thought would be interesting was, and this is a little bit counterproductive, because as I was explaining to the teens in the class this afternoon, there is a reason why none of the Egyptians are named in the book of Exodus. There's a very, very good reason. If you, have you ever looked at that? There's names galore in Exodus, but none of the Egyptians are named. There's no names of the pharaohs, even though there's pharaohs named in other parts of the Bible, and there are, the magicians aren't named. But people like the midwives, they have names. There's a reason behind that. Having said that, we're going to try and name the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And uh, it's a little bit of supposition, but I think it's kind of interesting to, to give an idea of who that Pharaoh might have been. So what we're going to look at first of all, then, is one of these creation myths. The ancient Egyptians had a number of creation myths. All of them were kind of weird in a lot of ways. They had similarities to each other, some differences. The one we're going to look at finds its origin in the city of Heliopolis here. Um, one of the other main creation myths was further south here. Uh, this is the one though that's relevant to the time of the Exodus. This is the area of Goshen up here, probably around that area. This is the geographic scene of the plagues and of the Exodus. So it's the, the myth that they believed in Heliopolis which is the important one for us. This is the area known in ancient times as Lower Egypt. and It's a little bit backwards from the way we look at maps. This is Lower Egypt. Down here is Upper Egypt. Uh, the, the Egyptians, if they had maps like this, would have looked at it reversed. Whereas we know that this is north and that is south. They looked at things the other way around. Lower Egypt at the top and Upper Egypt um, at the bottom, as far as we look at it. So, what was this Heliopolis creation myth? How did the Egyptians understand the creation of the world? And here is a summary of their creation myth up here. I know that's very small. Apologies to you all. And here is a family tree of some of the main gods of ancient Egypt, all of which came out of this creation myth. So what the Egyptians believed is that in the beginning there was this watery abyss, darkness and water, very similar to Genesis. So it starts off similarly to Genesis, but then it goes a little bit astray from what Genesis says. So you'll notice in this summary of the myth that there's this mound here that comes out of the watery abyss. This is the creation of land, and then on it is what the Greeks call the phoenix. This is kind of a, a Greek version of the Egyptian myth. The Egyptians, as we'll see later, called this the Bennu bird, and it was the first created thing. And then emerging then from this mound came 
the sun. And the sun then became the first god of the Egyptians, the main god of the Egyptians. And originally his name was Atum, and he had various other names, Ra, Re, Amun Re. There were various different names for this main god. And from this god came all the other gods. His two children were Shu and Tefnut, the gods of air and moisture. So anybody know, according to the Egyptians, how these gods came to be? How did Ammon give birth to these two gods, air and moisture? Where does air and moisture come from? How about, how about from sneezing and spitting? That's how he gave birth to them. I mean, it seems really, really bizarre to us, but these are ancient people who have no knowledge of God, no knowledge of science, no knowledge of how the world actually works and they've got to make sense of where does air and moisture come from well I know where air and moisture comes from when I sneeze or where I, when I spit there's air there's moisture so they put two and two together and said well that's probably how things happened in the beginning there was this big god, sun god he sneezed and he spitted and there was air and moisture and then uh, his grandchildren were the gods of earth and heaven Geb and Nut and the myth says that these siblings were absolutely inseparable. And this was a problem. No one could separate them. But eventually someone managed to separate them. And as a judgment, they were told that they could look at each other. So the earth god down here and the sky god up here, they could look at each other, but they could never actually touch again. So that's the origin of the earth and the sky, according to uh, the Egyptians. And then we have some other gods that you may have heard of. Osiris, he is the god connected with the river Nile. The, the Nile is his bloodstream, according to the ancient Egyptians. There's Isis, uh, Horus, this is the god mostly connected with Pharaoh. And uh, so the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. They had hundreds and hundreds of different uh, gods and goddesses. So when you look at something like this, it seems rather strange. But as I said, this is the Egyptians, the ancient people, trying to make sense of the world around them. And that's how idolatry came to pass. Why did people start to believe in gods? Because they saw something like a volcano, and now and then it would erupt. And they think, well, I don't know what causes that. It must be some sort of powerful deity. And so they start throwing uh, virgins down the mouth of the volcano to stop it from erupting. That's how paganism and idolatry began superstitious ideas of how things, how phenomena occur in the natural world. And of course in time uh, man came to understand things quite differently. So when it comes to this particular creation myth, what we find, and this is really true of all Egyptian creation myths, it's all based on the geography. What they were used to. So here is an ancient people who live on the banks of the River Nile. And we talked about this morning that they were a very orderly people who expected that the snows would melt up in the mountains and they would melt and come down and cause the Nile to flood, overflow its banks, fertile soil would rise up and they would have crops. That's how they lived. That's what they were used to. That was the order of the events in Egyptian life. And this creation myth is all based on that. Just think about this for a moment. You've got water, you've got earth rising out of a water, and then a bird appears upon this mound of earth. So, this is what happens when the inundation of the Nile occurs. The Nile floods, the waters come over the edge, and it causes land to appear. What's that all about? Well, this is how creation began, said the ancient Egyptians. And uh, you can go to Egypt even today, and this is a typical sort of scene that you will see. As soon as the inundation of the Nile occurs, you'll get these little mounds of earth appear, and the very first thing that lands on that mound of earth typically is a bird like a heron. Uh, the Egyptians called this the, the Bennu bird. And year after year after year, they see a reenactment of creation. This marvelous miracle. The Nile floods, the, the dry land appears, and then there's the bird. 
This was, in the minds of the Egyptians, the work of their various gods. This is a slide that we had in our class this morning, which summarizes it in a, a different picture. So here are the, the primeval waters, which were called Nu, or Nun. And there was a goddess that was named after this, the, the goddess Nu, the original uh, goddess. And then out of that comes this mound of earth, and here, is the, here are the first three gods, Atum, who later became the sun god, and Shu, the god of moisture, Tefnut, the god of air, and here are Geb and Nut, the gods of earth and sky. And then overriding it all, looking down upon this whole scene, is this concept here of Mart, which is the ancient Egyptian concept of order. And this, for them, was extraordinarily important, that this order of things occurred, that the snows did melt, that the water did flood over, that the fertile land did occur, and that the crops then could grow. And for anything to disrupt that was chaos. So when the plagues come, this is all destroyed, as we, as we discussed this morning. Uh, have you ever noticed that the, the ancient Egyptians are very fond of triangles? You get the pyramids, and you get the, the pointy bit on the end of their obelisks. Why all these triangles? Well, the origin is uh, this mound of earth. That's the origin of the shape of the pyramid and the top of the obelisk. It's called the Benben stone. Here's one that was dug up in an archaeological dig. Here's a pyramid, here's an obelisk. That's the mound of earth. This is a memorial to that first uh, creation out of the waters. And here then is the, the Bennu bird, or the phoenix as the Greeks called him. Here's a, a heron standing on a mound of earth, and uh, pictured here in uh, some Egyptian relief. So let's talk now then a little bit about order and chaos in Egypt. As I said, this is really, really important to the Egyptians. This is what God is disrupting in the, the story of the plagues. So I've got this excerpt here all about order. I'm not, not sure whether you can read that at the back, but uh, I blew it up as, as big as I could. It says that the, uh, the Egyptian culture was centered on order. Absolutely fundamentally important to the Egyptians was this idea of order. Everything had its due place in the world. And if anything was disrupted that, there were problems to the psyche of the Egyptians. This included religion, society, seasonal change, everything had to be done in the right order. The goddess Mart came to represent the concept of balance and order because many Egyptians needed to explain the world around them. She was the one that kept the stars in motion, the seasons changing, and maintaining the order of heaven and earth. So they thought there was this overriding concept that governed the behavior of the gods and the seasonal changes and the flooding of the Nile and all sorts of other things, and it was this idea of, of order or mart. And then, if we go down halfway here, the opposing force of this was in ancient terms, known in ancient terms as isfet or chaos, which also is as near as we can get the, the idea of sin in the eyes of the Egyptians. So this was the opposite, isfet. Ancient Egyptians considered the desert beyond the Nile River to be chaotic, whereas the area close to the Nile was considered orderly. Together, these two forces brought balance to the world in which they lived and was an important part of everyday Egyptian life. And another thing that it made the Egyptians was very xenophobic. We're going to talk about this, God willing, in our class tomorrow. They were very afraid of foreigners because foreigners meant chaos. And here they have a group of foreigners in the land of Goshen, and they're a problem. They threaten chaos to erupt. And here come Moses and Aaron, their leaders, and yes, their fears are realized as chaos does erupt in Egypt. And this would have been very, very concerning, very, very frightening 
for the Egyptians. So the king, Pharaoh, he was very much involved in this concept of Mart. Now think about this in relation to why was it that Pharaoh was so hard-hearted? Because part of his office was to establish Mart or order in Egypt. So Pharaoh was appointed to achieve Ma. This is one of his main duties. He had to establish law and order in Egypt. He had to keep and protect justice and harmony by destroying Isfet. So when Moses and Aaron come along, who does Pharaoh think they represent? Order or chaos? I mean, they're causing chaos in Egypt, so Pharaoh puts two and two together and thinks, well, this is, this is Isfet. This is, this is bad for Egypt. And he digs his heels in and says, I'm not going to let this people go. I'm not going to give in to chaos. No way. So a responsible kingship meant that, the, that Egypt would remain in prosperity and at peace of mind. However, if Isfet were to arise, humanity would decay and return to a primordial state. That is what the Egyptians were afraid of. They were afraid of exactly what the plagues were designed to do. To return Egypt to chaos. This primordial state. Decay was unacceptable as a natural course of events, which meant that the world was separated from the cosmos and away from order. And they were absolutely scared stiff of that. And we're going to show some examples of their writings that, that express that fear in a moment. Uh, there was another god that was associated with chaos. This god Apophis or Apep, various spellings of this particular god, pictured in Egyptian paintings as a serpent, interestingly. Uh, this god Apophis, which really represents the concept of chaos, the, the opposite of Mart, of order, uh, was the ancient Egyptian spirit of evil, darkness and destruction. The arch enemy of the sun god Ra. He was a malevolent force who would never be entirely be vanquished. Every night as the sun traveled through the underworld, so when, when everyone went to bed at night in ancient Egypt, they thought that Ra was making a dangerous journey through the underworld. And since he's gone for three days in plague number nine, they're pretty worried that he's been eaten up by this god Apophis. His roar would fill the air and he would launch his attack. They were scared of the dark, big time. That's the problem, of course, of superstition. You, you cling to these superstitious ideas and if anything upsets the balance, then you start to worry and become anxious. And dig your heels in and reinforce your superstitious beliefs. And that's exactly what happened to the ancient Egyptians. Now let's have a look at a couple of writings that express the Egyptian fear of chaos entering into their lives. This is called the Prophecy of Neferti. Uh, it was found uh, in a, an archaeological dig and it's dated to about maybe a thousand years before the Exodus. So it's not written during the time of the Exodus, but what it does is it illustrates how the Egyptians always had on their minds the fear that something like the ten plagues would occur. So this is just a little part of it. This is the actual text here. And even though I know you can read that, I thought I'd translate it into unreadable, tiny English for you. So I'll just read this to you. What was made has been unmade, says this prophecy. So what was made has been unmade. They were afraid of a reversal of creation. Ra should begin to recreate. The land is quite perished, no remnant is left. Not the black of a nail is spared from its fate. Yet while the land suffers, none care for it. None speak, none shed tears. How fair is this land? The sun disk, covered, shines not for people to see. Plague number nine again, the darkness. Their fears are realized. All happiness has vanished. The land is ruined. It's fate decree. There's an eerie echo with what the servants of Pharaoh said to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9. Egypt is ruined. Deprived of produce, lacking in crops, what was made has been unmade. And it's almost a prophecy of what happened in the, the time of the plagues. 
And uh, here's another one. And this fits in with the plague so much. This is called the Ipua papyrus. There are some ideas that this was actually an eyewitness account of the plagues from an Egyptian point of view. However, we can probably discount that. This, again, was probably written hundreds of years before the plagues. But, again, it expresses the fear of the Egyptians. This is not the whole thing. Again, this is just uh, some selections from it. Plague is throughout the land. That's what they were afraid of. Plague is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. It's almost as if God was playing with the Egyptians, with their fears, helping them realize, yes, your fears are right. You should be afraid of these things. But what you should be really afraid of is who created all of these things. The river is blood. Obvious echoes with the plagues here. Men shrink from tasting. Human beings and thirst after water. That is our water. That is our happiness. What shall we do in respect thereof? All is ruin. And you can imagine, can't you? You're living on the banks of the River Nile and you absolutely depend on this order of events happening. If the snows don't melt, you don't have a harvest at all. You're just in desert land. You're at the mercy of the elements then. All animals, their hearts weep. Cattle moan. Behold, cattle are left astray and there is none to gather them together. Forsooth, gates, columns and walls are consumed by fire. Lower Egypt weeps. The entire palace is without its revenues. To it belong by right wheat and barley, geese and fish. Forsooth, grain has perished on every side. Forsooth. I'm not sure the Egyptians actually said forsooth. <laughs> that has perished which was yesterday seen. The land is left over to its weariness like the cutting of flax. The land is without light. It almost reads, again, like the uh, eyewitness account of the, the plagues themselves. But it expresses what they were afraid of. And it came to pass in the story of the plagues. All right, well, let's now turn our attention to uh, another interesting question. And that is, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? And I'm not going to be dogmatic on this. There are various views. It's difficult to get the timing precise to determine who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. There is not only different chronologies of the Bible out there, there are different chronologies of Egyptian history. So this is not an exact science, but we are going to make an educated guess as to who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't really care who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. So hopefully, by the time this is finished, you'll be maybe a little bit interested in who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. Now here is an overall, overall timeline of ancient Egypt. This goes from 3000 BC to 250 BC on this chart. Egypt really continued beyond that into AD, into the, the Roman period of Egypt. But e ancient Egypt spanned thousands of years, over 3000 years of history. I mean that's immense. 3,000 years. That's longer than the Roman Empire. Um, it's longer than any other nation really has existed as a, a continue, in a continuous form in its own land. So Egypt is very, very, very significant as far as history is concerned. And probably in uh, ancient history class in school you learn quite a lot about Egypt. And uh, ancient Egypt was split uh, these red lines represent the main uh, eras of ancient history, which is split into what was called the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Different, uh, and, and different dynasties existed during each of those kingdoms. And in between those kingdoms were little periods of time where the Egyptians lost a lot of their power and other nations came in and they took over Egypt for a little while, and then Egypt re-emerged as a great power. What we're concerned with is the period of the New Kingdom here, which is the, the time of the Exodus. And uh, this chart is this New Kingdom period. You're not going to be able to read this. You don't have to. Uh, these, uh, these lines or these colors represent the different dynasties of kings different families of kings that reigned in Egypt at that time. So in the New Kingdom there were three dynasties, the Orange, the Green and the Blue Dynasty, 18th, 19th and 20th. 
And what we're concerned with is this 18th dynasty. And uh, this included such kings as Tutankhamun, one of the, the most famous uh, ancient Egyptian kings. So the date of the Exodus is rather controversial. But according to scripture, which is our guide in these things, of course, we can date the Exodus fairly accurately using a passage in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, that states that the Exodus took place 480 years before the construction of Solomon's temple. So we can more or less then get to within a year or two of when the Exodus took place. So we have a, a ballpark figure to work with. And um, what we find then is the Exodus really starts in Exodus chapter 1, before the Pharaoh of the Exodus. If you look at Exodus chapter 1 and then chapter 2, the first Pharaoh there dies and another Pharaoh takes over. So the Pharaoh at the beginning of the Exodus is not the Pharaoh that we're concerned with. So if we go back 480 years, we get to the reign of a man called Thutmose III, who reigned for about 60 years. He is probably the uh, Pharaoh who was the one who first started oppressing the Israelites. The story of the midwives and throwing the babies into the river and so forth. That was probably Thutmose III. And his son is the pharaoh that we're going to be concerned with. Uh, this is the, a list of the kings. Sorry again, it's so small. Um, here is Thutmose III here. And here is his son. I don't know whether you can read that, but his name was Amenhotep II. So that's the name you need to remember. That's the one we're going to suggest was the pharaoh who Moses and Aaron kept on saying, let my people go, and dug his heels in and said, no, I will not let your people go. His name was Amenhotep II. Now, here is some evidence, circumstantial evidence that points to him being the pharaoh of the Exodus. One interesting thing about this pharaoh was that he was unusual in a number of ways. For instance, he made his home up here in Memphis, which is, there's Heliopolis that we looked at earlier. Here is Memphis. This is the, the area of Goshen. This is the geographic area of the Exodus. Whereas a lot of other pharaohs, they were more concerned with upper Egypt down here. They held their, had their capitals uh, more offered in places like Thebes down here. But he, Amenhotep II, preferred to be in Lower Egypt in the area of Memphis. So that's evidence number one. So Amenhotep II was born and raised in Memphis in the north. Instead of Thebes, the traditional capital, while a prince, he oversaw deliveries of wood sent to the dockyard of Peru Nufe in Memphis and was made the Seten, the high priest, over Lower Egypt. So he kind of moved the headquarters of Egypt to to lower Egypt. So he's, again, an ideal candidate. Now another noteworthy thing about Amenhotep was that he was not a firstborn son. Which when you know the story of the plagues is actually pretty important. Because if he was a firstborn son, what would have happened to him in plague number 10? Exactly. He would have died, and who would have been the one who said, well, now we've let them go, I've changed my mind, let's go after them and send his armies to the Red Sea. He's dead, he can't do that. So, he couldn't have been a firstborn son. Well, it so happens. Remember Thutmose III, the first king in Exodus? Amenhotep II was not the firstborn son of Thutmose III. This is evidenced by an inscription from the Karnak Festival Hall, which is a, an absolutely enormous temple that they dug up in ancient Egypt, which dates to the 24th year of the reign of Thutmose III that identifies Amenemnet, not Amenhotep, there's been a quiz later on these names, as being the king's eldest son. So this guy here, Amenem, Amen, 
Esther told me to practice these names beforehand. Ah, Amen Emet. I think that's right, Amen Emet. That's a different name to Amen Otep, who we're concerned with. He was the king's eldest son, this guy. It reads, appointing the king's eldest son, Amenetet, as overseer of cattle. So it appears that at some point, this eldest son must have either died or he wasn't given the, uh, the, cr uh, the crown by the pharaoh, excuse me, before him. What about then the next pharaoh after Amenhotep II, who was called Thutmose IV. Now, if Thutmose IV, who was the son of Amenhotep, was the firstborn son of that pharaoh, he couldn't have been king, could he? Because he would have died in plague number 10. Well, it just so happens that Amenhotep II's eldest son did not take the throne. The dream stellar of Thutmose IV, which is this thing here, who was Amenhotep the son's son, that's the next pharaoh, says Thutmose IV was not the legitimate successor to the throne. This means he was not the firstborn son who would have been the legitimate heir. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that the firstborn son of Amenhotep II had somehow died prior to taking the throne. Hmm. I wonder how he died, perhaps in plague number 10. And what we find, brothers and sisters, young people, is the more we look at this Amenhotep II, the more things just kind of click into place. It's like putting a jigsaw piece puzzle together, and look, everything's emerging, just perfect. It is actually quite, uh, quite remarkable. Now, let's have a look at something else which I found really intriguing. Thutmose III has been described by ancient uh, Egyptian scholars as the Egyptian Napoleon. A man of conquest, a man of power. Thutmose II is often compared to Napoleon, but unlike Napoleon, he never lost a battle. He conducted 16 campaigns in Palestine, Syria, and Nubia, and his treatment of the conquered was always humane. He established a sort of Pax Egyptica over his empire. Syria and Palestine were obliged to keep the peace, and the region as a whole experienced an unprecedented degree of prosperity. His impact upon Egyptian culture was profound. He was a national hero, revered long after his time. Indeed, his name was held in awe, even to the last days of ancient Egyptian history. This is the, the pharaoh, we believe, who was the initial oppressor of the Israelites. His military achievements brought fabulous wealth and his family resided over a golden age that was never surpassed. So this was the Egyptian Napoleon, who was a man who conducted 16 campaigns of war against uh, foreign nations. But for some reason, when his son came on the throne, despite him introducing this golden age of Egyptian power, after his reign, everything just went woof, dropped suddenly, for no apparent reason. Why did that happen? Why did Egyptian power suddenly not degrade over time, which is the normal way that things happen, it just completely dropped off the cliff in the reign of his son, Amenhotep II. So the renowned conqueror Thutmose III led, uh, this one says 17 military campaigns, as debate over the number of campaigns, but suffice it to say, he was a man of war. Uh, but his son, the pharaoh that we're concerned with, in stark contrast, led only two or three. Why the sudden drop-off? While many scholars have attempted to determine the exact number, there exists a virtual dearth of discussion about this sharp decline. The Egyptians didn't want to talk about what happened here. It's as if they were embarrassed by this sudden drop-off of power. Why? Uh, Aaroni, an Egyptian uh, historian, attributes it to an underlying diminishment of Egyptian power. Already in the days of Amenhotep II, the son of Thutmose III, cracks began to appear in the structure of the Egyptian empire. Another scholar 
hints at the dissipation of Egypt's might by the end of Amenhotep II's reign, it seems possible to consider this reign as unsuccessful, a time of decline. A few exploits abroad, a few preserved memorials, an almost complete absence of sources after, note this, the ninth year of his reign. And for some reason, after the ninth year of this king's reign, it's blank. Hardly a record, hardly a memorial. So if the Egyptian said, let's not write about this, let's put our computers away and let's play cards instead because we're a little bit embarrassed about what happened after the ninth year of his reign. So what happened? It's an interesting question. Well, let's have a look at uh, some of these are the campaigns that he did undertake. He did undertake a campaign in year seven of his reign, which is a typical sort of Egyptian campaign, and he did undertake a campaign in that significant year nine of his reign. And that was the last of his campaigns. None, none after that. He stopped after year nine. And this year nine campaign, where you can see, here's Egypt down here. This is the land of Canaan. It's a very, very unusual campaign as far as the Egyptians are concerned. Historians are mystified about this campaign. Everything about this campaign is wrong. It was at the wrong time of year. It just doesn't make sense from a strategic point of view. And there's certain things about this campaign that just mystify the mind. Why is that the case? Well, it's rather intriguing, this last campaign of Amenhotep. Um, if his reign began in about 1455 BC, which harmonizes with the Ebers, Papyrus, and regnal lengths of the blah, 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 um, his ninth year, okay, this significant year nine, when all the records of his reign suddenly stop, from about November 1447 to November 1446, and therefore the exodus date of April 1446, should be placed within this particular regnal year. So about halfway through this year, this ninth year of his reign, was the proposed date of the Exodus. Is that a coincidence or is there something going on here? Uh, this scholar says the present date would fall in the early part of November, an unusual season for an Egyptian campaign in Asia. They didn't go to war. You remember in the, uh, the Bible it says in that passage in uh, the story of David and Bathsheba that uh, he didn't go out to war at the time when kings went out to war. There was a season for, well there was a war season. So now we have spring, autumn, summer, winter. But that, back then they had spring, summer, autumn, war. And war was not during November. You didn't go to war in November. It wasn't done. But for some reason, this king decided in November, he just had to go up to Canaan to do something. Why? What was going on in his mind? What's also unusual about this, and completely out of Egyptian character, they had an ongoing uh, battle with one of their main enemies called the Mitanni, who lived uh, north of Israel. And they kept on having these battles with the Mitanni. It was a bit like the Montagues and the Capulets, and they, ne they didn't like each other. But for some reason, they decided to sign a peace treaty at this time. Completely out of Egyptian character, with their sworn enemy. So there's a number of things going on here which are, are kind of unusual. Now here's another thing. When they went on their campaigns, their war campaigns, they used to take people captive. But they weren't like the Assyrians, who used to take this whole mass of people captive. They just took a few select people captive. So, in uh, Thutmose III's case, these are typical numbers of his campaigns. He took about 6,000, which was a lot. He took a couple of hundred, 400 or 500 people captive. Uh, his son, Amenhotep II, our pharaoh, in his first campaign, he took a couple of thousand, but in this unusual campaign, at an unusual time of year, 
for some reason he decides to take a completely out of proportion and unusual 100,000 people captive. Why would you do that? Why would you choose to rush into war and go up to the land of Canaan and grab 100,000 people? Why do that? Unless, perhaps, you've lost a bunch of people who you know have journeyed towards that area and they were your slaves and now you've lost all this slave labor. Who's going to build my storehouses? I better go up there and, and find them. So that's the theory of what happened here. And we, uh, we sometimes think that Pharaoh actually died in the Red Sea. There's no evidence that that happened. His armies died in the Red Sea. But it's probable that Pharaoh himself did not die in the Red Sea. And so the theory here is that after the dust has settled a little bit, he gathers together a, a few other people who he can turn into this makeshift army, and he goes up into the land of Canaan with the express intention, I just need to get more slaves. And he brings 100,000 people then back down into Egypt. Then he stops. He says, we don't really have an army that can withstand campaign after campaign. Let's make a peace treaty with our enemies. And let's sort of just regroup a little bit here. And that's when all these records of the great Egyptian exploits suddenly vanish off the scene. Now, just before we finish, there is one more um, interesting point to be made here. We're going to look at this, God willing, in our class on Wednesday. This is plague number seven, the plague of hail. And you see a hail, bolt of hail coming down here and fire. This was, this was scary hail. Fire mingled in the hail. And this was a, a special plague for Pharaoh himself. This is the plague that actually managed to penetrate the hard heart of Pharaoh. This got to Pharaoh, this plague number seven. It says in Exodus 9, this time I'll send all my plagues on your heart. Okay? This was a plague that, a, that was a personal plague, especially for Pharaoh himself. Now why is that so significant? Well, if we were to turn to Psalm 78, there is a poetic reference to plague number 7 in Psalm 78, verse 48 which says he gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to thunderbolts. Now what's interesting about that is the Hebrew word for thunderbolts just so happens to be also the name of a false god. And this is sometimes what the poetic parts of the Bible do. It's the way in which the Bible takes the names of false gods and takes the myth out of those gods and says this is just a thunderbolt and this particular word in the Hebrew is this word here reshef. This is from a, a lexicon concerning this particular word used to describe plague number seven. The view has been expressed that reshef in Job chapter 5 verse 7, another occurrence of this particular world, word, refers not to literal sparks but to reshef the god of fever and pestilence. So scholars are agreed that this word probably comes from uh, ancient pagan religion and was borrowed in Hebrew, or rather, we should say the, the word was borrowed from Hebrew and applied to pagan gods. And this, this is a word that actually refers to this god, Reshef. Here he is. That is the god Reshef. He's actually quite a famous god in uh, particularly in the land of Canaan. He's not an Egyptian god. He's a Canaanite god. He was a god associated with plague in ancient Canaanite religion. It is thought that his name originally derived from the Hebrew for flame or plague. So there's, there it is again. That's that word that we looked at in Psalm 78. Now why is this important as far as our Pharaoh is concerned? It just so happens that the Egyptians were very fond of foreign gods. And 
pharaohs from time to time would look at one of these foreign deities and say, I kind of like that god. I'm going to adopt him as my god. And they would incorporate the worship of that god into their religion. And one of those was this god, Resheth. And you won't be able to read this, but I'll read it for you. It says, Although the discoveries at uh, Ras Shamra Ugrit have only recently focused attention on the Canaanite Reshef, whose cult was brought to Egypt in the middle of Dynasty 18. So Reshef finds an adoption in Egypt in the middle of the exact dynasty that we're looking at. And look what it says down here. Uh, this fellow Bernard uh, Gredzolf added to the material collected by Levovich and established the reign of Amenophis, which is another name for Amenhotep, it's the same pharaoh, as the date of the introduction of the cult in Egypt. So the Egyptians started worshipping Reshef exactly in the reign of Amenhotep II. And they have found a scarab seal, which was a seal of Amenhotep II. And the seal inscription says, a heber, I'm not sure what that means, but that's or that, what that says, but it is another name for Amenhotep II, the name of the king, the beloved of Reshef. So isn't that interesting? In the, in the plague that reached Pharaoh's heart, the personal plague, for this pharaoh, for some reason, the spirit decided to use the name of a god which was adopted by this particular pharaoh, the beloved of Reshef. And uh, what's interesting is that Reshef became popular in Egypt under Amenhotep II, where he served as god of horses and chariots. So that's what Amenhotep II said. I need a god of horses and chariots. Well, I'm going to adopt Reshef to do that. He's going to be my god of horses and chariots. So it's very significant then, I think, that in the final destruction of the Egyptians, in Exodus chapter 14, what was destroyed was his chariots and his horsemen. He destroys the beloved god of Amenhotep II. Anyways, I said that's not something to be dogmatic about, but I think if you put all the pieces together, it does become rather interesting. So our time is up, and I um, recommend, if you're interested, look some more into these, uh, these pharaohs at the time of the Exodus. It's, it's absolutely fascinating, and it gives you a really good handle on the experiences of Israel in Egypt and then how that can apply to our experiences too.